Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Bill Harwood. Um, I represent a company called Itilmatch Chemicals. And um, I'm here today to talk to you about some polymeric emulsifiers that we've developed for the metalworking industry. This is my first time here. I, uh, it's good to see that we've got a good turnout. Um, I think the presentation that I have to share with you today is going to be very interesting for those people who are involved in the metalworking industry. Um, and um, uh, it kind of follows on from what Claudio was saying earlier on in terms of some of the things that we, he was talking about in terms of the market. Um, so really what I'd like to do is just give you a very brief introduction to, um, to it'll match as, a, as an organization. I'll look at some of the trends and the drivers in the industry as it, as it relates to uh, globally, uh, to the trends and drivers and so on, and then talk about some of the newer technologies that we've developed for the industry. Um, and really I hope that at the end of this meeting you have a, a good understanding of some of these technologies uh, for how they're used and, and why they're used and why we have uh, developed them. Um, I will also say that um, I'll try and leave some time at the end of the presentation so you can ask some questions if you have any. Um, but more importantly, if you'd like to, um, uh, for us to come and visit you at, at, at any particular point in time when we can talk to you about these products in, 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 in greater detail. Firstly, a little bit about Ittle Match Chemicals. Um, it really is a global specialty group of companies with um, a focus on a, a wide range of different things, including uh, lubricants, water and oil, detergents, plastic additives, um, and they have market and technology leadership in phosphorus derivatives, polymers, esters, chlorides, and um, from synthetic to fully natural products. There are seven manufacturing facilities in Europe, five in Asia Pacific, and the company is headquartered in Italy, um, but it has global coverage by having subsidiaries here in Brazil, in Belgium, Poland, the USA, Japan, Singapore, and China. In fact, I am located in the USA facility in Cleveland, Ohio. And one thing you'll notice is that Although this is a, uh, um, a, a range of different organizations and uh, um, different companies, um, I represent what's called the Lubricants Performance Additives Group, which consists of mainly, from my perspective, metalworking fluids, but it also consists of companies, uh, a company called Alco, which is involved in um, EP additives for, for you know, greases and um, uh, gear oils and so on, and uh, corrosion inhibitors, and then we also represent the catch and lube line of products, which is, they are polymeric esters, which you probably heard of before. But anyway, here's a quick snapshot of what that, of the group of companies is involved with, but I'm here specifically to talk to you about metalworking, uh, and that's my role today. So let's build a little upon what uh, Claudia was talking about earlier in terms of uh, industry trends. So working our way from the bottom to the top, if you think about metalworking as a the way that it operates, we have the machine tools. So you've got companies building machine tools, and they are really there to help companies produce products much more quickly, more e effectively, and more efficiently, and it sort of builds on this productivity story. Those machine tools themselves are becoming much more complex. They are capable of doing a wide range of different things. You know, many, many years ago, you'd find a line of uh, individual machines doing different operations. Today, one machine does several different operations. Um, the speeds at which they operate now are much, much greater, and they typically tend to be much smaller. The sumps as well are much, much smaller, and therefore the cycle times are much smaller. Then you think about the uh, tooling companies and what they are trying to do to increase productivity. Um, they are really um, trying to make sure that their tools last much, much longer. Um, and in order to do that, they are introducing high pressure coolant systems. Uh, and they need to do that in order to get the coolant to the tool to cool and lubricate those particular uh, operations. And then the materials themselves are changing in the market too. 
Um, you're all aware of lightweight light weighting that is taking place in the market and the change in different types of materials, particularly in aerospace and places like that where titanium and these high uh, uh, alloy steels are being used. They are much more difficult to machine um, and they also put a lot of stress on the emulsions themselves. And then the availability of raw materials is becoming more and more difficult. So biocides, for example, are becoming uh, more restricted for use in certain parts of the world. The use of boron technology is becoming less and less. Um, there's the growth of group two, reduction of group one. All the things that Claudio was talking about earlier, uh, we're just building on that theme. And the prices of raw materials are fluctuating as well. So anyway, what this means is, is that um, when you as formulators or end users, you need to think about what impact that does have on the lubricants that you're providing to the companies themselves. So uh, with that, there's a greater uh, potential for foam in the systems that you are going to be supplying product to. Um, and the stresses on the emulsions are going to become much, much greater because there's a small amount of fluid being used. It's being used at higher pressures and so on. Uh, there's increased risk of air entrainment. And there's also the demand that the companies want these fluids to last a long, long time. It's all about increasing productivity and reducing cost. So these are great challenges for the formulator. <clears throat> so that's what's going on today. Uh, when I was preparing for this presentation, I was just, I came across this article and it was found in uh, Cutting Tool Engineering. It was actually written in 2011, so 2011. And just very, very briefly, this guy wrote about all these things that are going on in the market. I think that these things are still true today. There's still problems with rust, residue, dermatitis, foul odors and foam. Um, the sumps, because they are smaller, they tend to generate a lot more foam. Bigger bubbles burst much more quickly than smaller bubbles. Um, and I hadn't thought about this, but foam creates an insulating layer causing heat buildup, especially with high pressure pumps which generate significant amounts of heat. Um, the filtration systems can remove anti-foaming particles and so on. So all of these things, this was written in 2011, I think if you look at the industry today, we still have these issues that we have to try and overcome. Um, and so one of you know, my role as part of being a product manager is trying to understand these trends and then translating these trends into chemistries which you can use in the industry. And those are the chemistries that I'd like to talk to you about today. Connected with the, this industry trend, this is a report from Modern Machine Shop Survey. This is actually relating to the US. Uh, I believe it's true around the world. And this is around small machine shops. Small machine shops represent a very large proportion of the industrial sector. Um, but you can see that uh, from 2010 to 2014, the number of machine shops that are using high pressure coolant systems is increasing. Uh, that represents over a fourfold increase. I don't know what the number is today in 2018, but my guess is it's the best part of 55%. The, the, the point here is, is that it's increasing. So high pressure coolant delivery systems are increasing. Just quickly looking at um, different uh, method methodologies around delivering coolant to the, the tool. Um, um, and this represents high pressure coolant delivery systems or ultra high pressure coolant delivery systems. They're becoming more important. And that slide I've just shown you shows you that. And the reason for that is precisely what these pictures in this, in this slide shows you. So on the left hand side is a tool that has been used for three minutes using regular coolant delivery system. And you can see that after three minutes it's fairly bashed up, it's beaten up, it's worn out. Um, and then using uh, an, another, the same tool, but this time using ultra high coolant pressure systems, you can see that after three minutes the tool itself is still in very good shape. This is the reason why tooling companies are promoting the use of high pressure coolant systems. So how are foams generated? This is our simplified view of how to look at foams and emulsions. So in order to get oil into water, you need a surfactant. 
With that surfactant, you've got a, uh, a hydrophobic tail and a hydrophilic head. Um, so in other words, something that dislikes water and something that likes water. And this is represented below in this, this diagram here. So the blue part represents the water phase, and you can see the, um, uh, the, the, the surfactant molecules are sort of, the hydrophilic part is sticking in the water phase, and the oil is represented by the green uh, material there, and that's where the hydrophobic tail is sitting in there. So that's without agitation. You agitate it, you generate an emulsion. So you get the emulsion. Now the oil is now surrounded by these surfactant molecules where you get the, the tail sticking in the oil, and you get the surfactant molecule on the outside sticking on to the, in the water phase. So that's how you get the emulsion, and that's what it looks like. I think you're all familiar with this concept. Okay, but if you put more energy into that emulsion, what then happens is you start generating bubbles. And the bubbles are what we call foam. And so what actually happens is that the bubbles now um, are surrounded by the surfactant molecules represented by the, the bubble layer that you can see. And that's how you get this, this foam generated. Okay, so the chemistry that I want to talk to you about now is what we have developed recently. So this is a standard emulsifier that represents this foam situation. So that's what the standard emulsifier looks like. You can see that when they are, when you put lots of them in there, they all line with themselves, like parts for like parts. And then you introduce it to the foamy space, and that gray area there uh, represents the, um, the, the water phase. And you can see that they're all um, sticking in the water phase, and the outside part is sticking in the air. So that phase represents the bubble. So the, the material that we've developed looks something like this. So it's more of a, it's a polymeric branched material. And the water liking parts and the oil liking parts are in different spaces within the molecule. And so when they align, they don't align to create a continuous film. So therefore the foam is not able to stabilize. And so a standard emulsifier would generally give you a very foamy liquid because the foam is stabilized. But with this new technology here at the bottom here, you can see that we get a reduced amount of foam because the foam is unstable. It's not able to form that continuous film. OK, so that leads me on to talk about the product that we developed. So that technology that I shared with you there in the bottom, at the bottom there is what we call our Politec EA700 series. Um, and the first product that we developed was called Politec EA700. And it kind of addresses a lot of the issues that that cutting tool engineering guy had spoken about. Um, so initially, we were thinking about that we needed to reduce the amount of foam that is generated in emulsions. Um, so this product is primarily an emulsifier, but it addresses a wide range of different things. And I don't have time to go into the level of detail that the material uh, can do, but this summarizes it very, very broadly. So it's a very good emulsifier. It, it forms very stable emulsions, not only in, in even in very, very hard waters. Um, even in high bacterial situations, the emulsions remain very stable. And this in itself contributes to long life. So this helps that story around better productivity, uh, reduced costs, and so on. It's also very, very low foaming for the very reasons that I've just spoken to you about. It's also low foaming to in soft water as well as hard water situations. Um, and they also, it's very low foam in high pressure operations too. There's been a lot of talk today about base stock availability and, and so on. So companies have to use the base stocks that are available to them to emulsify. This product is capable of emulsing a wide range of different base stocks, naphthenic, paraphenic, uh, group ones and group twos and so on. Uh, so that helps in a wide range of different things. Because it's, not a, um, because it's a polymeric type product, it's not affected by hard water soaps and so on. So there's no scum formation. So it gives you a very, very clean emulsion doesn't clog up the filters and so on. And because of the nature of the molecule, it's a very large molecule, it does give a degree of lubricity to, the, to uh, emulsions as well. Um, 
just a little bit about how we went about developing this particular product. We, um, we recognize that lab bench tests don't allow you to do high pressure uh, machining tests. You, it's very difficult to do that. So we went ahead and we built something ourselves uh, where we bought a pump that's typically used in a, in a high pressure coolant operation and we built this, this machine here. Uh, it holds 50 liters of product, so you make the emulsion, you run it for a certain period of time, and you can measure the amount of foam that's above the surface of the liquid and the amount of foam that's below the surface of the liquid. And after that, you can also see how quickly it collapses when you turn the pump off. And you can also look at how clean the emulsion is as well. So we found this to be a very, very powerful tool in demonstrating what we needed to do. And here you can see this is a graph representing that information. So we have a reference fluid based on regular emulsifiers. And the vertical axis represents the foam height. Um, and the zero represents the coolant, uh, the, the coolant layer, if you like. Um, so anything above that is represented as foam. Anything below that is represented as air entrainment. And so you can see a regular fluid when running through that, you get a foam height of uh, 80 millimeters and a foam uh, entrainment of around just around about 70 millimeters. And then you turn it off and you can see that it takes time to, to defoam. A product developed on um, EA700, the, the polymeric emulsifier, you can see the foam reduction there is, is much, much greater. That's represented by the, uh, whatever this pointy thing is, this part here. Okay, and you can see that the foam reduction there is tremendous. It's much, much lower, uh, as well as the defoaming part as well. Um, we also took these formulations and put them into real world situations and this sort of thing was demonstrated in the real world as well. Again, if you wanna see more, we can share it with you, but I don't have time today. In terms of emulsion stability, we thought one way of trying to demonstrate emulsion stability was to, to actually measure the particle size and see what happens to the particle size of the emulsion over time. Um, so what this graph will sh sh show with you is that you've got the percentage particle size uh, on the vertical axis and then you've got the particle size on the horizontal axis. The green part there is the EA700 uh, initial fill. Okay, so what you're looking for is a very narrow peak, so the particle size are represented in that particular space. Okay, and then you can see that in different water hardnesses represented by those different colors there, after one week, you can see that there's been a very slight drift uh, in the particle size. So you can see that this represents a very, it's a strong indication of a particle size um, is remaining very, very strong even in extremely hard water. And you can see that the orange line there is represented by um, 1,000 parts per million water hardness. So very, very stable. <clears throat> so that particular product is called Politec EA700. It has an HLB of around about 11. So it was really designed for emulsifying mineral oils. Um, we have since then developed another product which is called Politec EA710. It's based upon the same chemistry, but this material has an HLB of around about four. Um, and we will be introducing it into the market around about quarter three this year. Okay, very, very similar story. So it's based upon the same chemistry. You can use it in combination with the EA710, but it gives you very low foam emulsions. It is also very, very clean in terms of how it's used. Um, uh, you can use it in combination with the EA700, so you can balance the 11, the HLB of 11 and the HLB of four and get the right HLB that you need for your system. Or you can use the EA710 specifically to emulsify vegetable oils. Um, there's a trend in certain parts of the world where vegetable oils are needed in certain applications and the EA710 gives a very, very strong emulsion around that. Because these molecules are very large, they are biologically very resistant, so they don't get eaten by bacteria, so you get uh, good long life emulsions. In terms of demonstrating the foam, this is just another way of demonstrating foam performance. This is, here is a Konomo test. Basically it's one liter of fluid, 5% emulsion, you run it for a certain period of time, you measure the foam height, 
And what you really want to see is um, a, you know, a low, slow buildup um, of foam, a very stable uh, low foam propensity. And when you turn it, uh, the pub off, you want to see quick collapse. So the blue line represents a product made without the EA710, and the yellow line represents a product made with EA710. So you can see there's a dramatic difference there. It's a, a very, very low foaming product. I mentioned to you that it can be used for emulsifying um, vegetable oils. In this instance, this is just an example of taking uh, the EA710, using it with um, uh, rapeseed oil in this particular instance, and here you can see that we've measured the particle size in 1,000 ppm, and you can see that you get a very, very nice, even distribution particle size there, and so that just tries to demonstrate that you've got a very good, strong, stable emulsion. Um, like I said, it's uh, HLB4, and it can be used for emulsifying a wide range of different things. These are just examples of some of the things that we've tested. So, for example, TMPTO, uh, um, rapeseed oil or sunflower oil, and I needed to make a note. What is TMPTO? That is trimethylpropane trioleate, for those of you who need to know. Um, <laughs> Uh, but there you go. So it can be used to emulsify a wide range of different things. And these are just examples of some of the things that we've tested. Um, with the introduction of this product, we will be sharing with you how to go about formulating with these particular materials. And um, these are just examples of how you can go about doing it. And again, this is, this is wrapped around talking about EA710, how it can be used with EA700 um, and the the EA140, I'm not here to talk to you about that, but that's an ethoxylated castor oil. Um, and you can see that you can, with a very simple formulation, you can achieve a very, very good uh, product. And at the bottom there, you can see a product called Polatec LA8005. I'll talk to you a little bit more about that, but that's a lubricant that we found that can work very, very well in combination with the EA700 and EA710. Um, so again, I don't propose to go into any great detail about this. This is more a case of just sharing with you that when we do launch these products, we do have a lot of information to help you formulate with them so you don't have to go about starting from scratch. We'll give you that guidance. This is an example of just taking that rapeseed and emulsifying it uh, using EA710 and comparing it with ethoxylated castor. In our experience, ethoxylated castor oil is is the emulsifier of choice today when you want to emulsify um, uh, vegetable oils. So we took that, we thought that was the sort of market leader, if you want to put it that way. Uh, and we've also compared it with sorbitum monooleate. Um, so the EA710, you can see on the left, top left there, that's in deionized water, gives you a very strong, narrow peak. Again, this is particle size distribution. And then with 200 ppm water and 500 ppm water, these are, snap, these are the particle sizes after one week. And you can see that the, um, the, the Polatec EA710, the blue line there, uh, the light blue line, is, gives you a very, very stable emulsion, unlike the other ones which seem to go all over the place. So availability and registration. So the EA700 today is available. We launched that product around about 18 months ago. Um, so it's commercially available. If you want products and samples and so on, we can get that to you. The EA710, like I said, will be available around about third quarter this year. Uh, and samples are available. We'll have to get them from the manufacturing location, which is in Manchester, England. Uh, in terms of regulations, these are REACH registered products. They are low polymers of concern, and they are also Tosca uh, compliant too. So let me talk to you a little bit about uh, Polatec LA8005. So for metalworking formulators, I'd like you to think about this product as a product which is easy to formulate with. Um, it improves tool life and surface finish. It's really a lubricant. It's designed as a lubricant. And if you use it in combination with the EA710 or uh, 700, um, you get very, very stable emulsions. So you can use this product for machining high chrome and high carbon steels or even aluminum alloys or aluminum alloys. Okay, uh, this is just a very 
a brief structure uh, slide on what this material is. Um, it's a natural product. It's, it's polymeric in nature, um, and it has a slight acid value. <coughs> Not only can you use it in water-based emul emulsions, but you can use it in neat oils as well. So it's soluble in a wide range of different uh, base stocks. And here you can see pictures of, of it being soluble in paraffinic, naphthenic, and vegetable oils. It's 5% dilution here. So it is suitable for straight oil formulations if you need to use it in that way. As I said, it's, it's got a slight acid value, so you can neutralize it with an amine. In this case, we've neutralized it with triphenolamine. And, it, and you can see that it uh, gives you a, a stable emulsion, a relatively stable emulsion. I don't recommend that you use it by itself. The intention here is to show you that it, you can solubilize it quite easily. Okay. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with twist compression. Um, twist compression is a, uh, a method of trying to understand the lubricant properties of a particular product. We typically use it for um, uh, drawing and stamping fluids and basically what you're doing is you have a piece of sheet metal and you have the ring uh, apl applied with pressure on top and you twist it and you just wait and see what uh, measurement you get on torque there and we find this is very it correlates very well with drawing and stamping fluids um, and then there's also the four ball wear test which I'm sure you're all familiar with um, that that is you know you've got a rotating chuck put some pressure on it, and you put the lubricant in there, and you generate a number. So here, if you look at, um, we've taken the Polatec LA8005, we diluted it in, in naphthenic oil at 15%, and we generated some results in the twist compression and the four ball. Um, and we compared it against chlorinated, a 60% chlorinated paraffin product, a 15% sulfurized ester product. Um, and the numbers on the, uh, in the columns there are that are being generated. So with twist compression, the higher the number, the better the property of that uh, lubricant that you're testing. So in this particular instance, um, the LA8005 in the twist compression gave a very, very similar number to sulfurized ester. So if you wanted to replace sulfurized ester, in, say, drawing and stamping fluid, this, this could be a, a way of going about it. Um, and then in four ball, you can see that a very similar result was achieved, but in four ball, you're looking for a lower number. And here you can see that we got a very low number um, overall. Um, and again, if you're looking to replace chlorate of paraffins, this could be an option too. Okay, the interesting thing about the LA8005 is that when you do put it into a formulation, it actually um, helps to stabilize a, the formulation overall. So it, it reduces the number of cu couplers that you need to put into a product and so on. So it provides a very, very stable emulsion. And this here gives you uh, a sense of what that is. So um, here we're comparing one ester um, in the far right-hand cor corner there called ester B. And you can see that as the emulsion hardness increases, the stability of the emulsion drops. So the LA8005 does provide you a very, very stable emulsions. In terms of foaming, we spoke about Konomo. This is another uh, test just showing you different results relating to Konomo. The thing that I want to point out to you here is the blue line there. That is the LA8005. There you can see it's a very, very low foaming material. So it's uh, it's, uh, it does provide you that low foam performance. So in combination with the low foam emulsifier, low foam lubricant, you get a low foam um, uh, product overall. This is interesting. We took a, uh, a typically used um, uh, drawing and stamping fluid, and we dried it in the oven, and we produced residues. And here you can see the one on the left-hand side, the residue is very, very difficult to clean off. Um, you know, so we ran the, um, the water over the, the fluid, and you can see it doesn't remove. So on the right-hand side, the video that you're seeing now shows you that incorporating LA-1005 does help to wash off residues as they are formed in these particular instances. So the LA-1005 overall does have some very, very good properties which you should take advantage of. So in summary, um, we try to keep close to what's happening to the industry 
um, and we actively monitor those things so we um, do understand what's, we try to understand what's going on in the marketplace and we try to therefore then try and develop technology that will help to uh, improve the, the, the technology that you have today. Okay, so the challenges that the markets are faced with today is the change in regulations, the change in chemistries that you're allowed to use, You've got the, the materials which are changing, particularly in the aerospace industry and in the automotive industry. The machine tools are changing, and there's also advances in, in tooling technology and so on. But together, it's, it's useful to understand that because then it helps you to develop technology that can actually address those particular issues. And I'm hoping today that I've demonstrated that these new technologies that we've produced, the, the, the Polartec EA700 and the EA710, go a long way in helping to address some of the issues that the industry is faced with today. And um, so we try to translate these things into things that the industry really, really needs. So in broad summary then, the, the EA700 and EA710 are very powerful emulsifiers, providing very, very low foam technology. And in combination with the Polartec LA8005, you can get very, very strong uh, market-leading technology in the marketplace. With regards to Ittle Match, our focus from a metalworking perspective is really upon emulsification, lubrication, and corrosion inhibition. And those are represented by our Polatec brand of products, which is, in the case of emulsification, it's Polatec EA series. In terms of lubrication, it's Polatec LA series and then corrosion inhibition is BA and DA series. Um, we are an active member of STLE. You heard that mentioned earlier by Claudio. And our R&D manager gave a presentation there on hard metal machining and how to develop technology for that. Uh, if you're interested in a copy of that paper, I can certainly get that to you. OK, so that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm happy to take any questions now. <laughs>